Let's go. Shantanu Naidu, Mr. Ratan Tata's millennial friend. Shantanu, describe Mr. Ratan Tata in one word. Kind. One trait that you have displayed, perhaps, to have had this journey at the Tata Group. Curiosity. Talking about inspirational entrepreneurs, name some for us. Bhavish Agarwal is definitely uh, one of them. One word for 70 hours working week comment. Personal choice. As a millennial, one word for social media. That's a tough one. <laughs> Silence. That's what I'm getting. One word for AI. Responsibility again. The idealization yeah. culture is what is the issue. So. Ah. We always want someone else to give us the answer that mm. how many hours should I be working, and then someone who you look up to says these many hours you should be working, mm. and then you want to follow just that. The person joining us next, his designation is that of a general manager at Tata, but his identity largely is that of a social entrepreneur. He is an author. He is also a singer. But the one thing you know him most for is being Mr. Tata's millennial friend. Shantanu, thank you so much for joining us and talking to us. Is that a fair introduction to what your life is? Heavier than what I would like, but uh, <laughs> fair. Okay. Nice to be here, sir. Shantanu, I'm quite intrigued by the different projects that you've been picking up, working with the Tata Trust. It is about, you know, older people, lonely people at one hand. It is about strays and dogs the other. Uh, at a time, you're you're what thirty, right? Uh, yeah, thirty-one. You're thirty-one. You're almost my age, and a lot of, and this is the age of a lot of entrepreneurs and startup owners as well. At a time when you have an entire generation which is looking at valuation, startups, and you know, doing path-breaking stuff at AI, what keeps bringing you back to sort of this sort of social entrepreneurship, or to do more for others than actually your bank balance? I think. Entrepreneurship is the pursuit of picking a problem and solving it, picking a really tough problem and solving it, and all the profitable startups and kudos to them for having done what they have. They have picked a problem, they have solved it successfully and made it profitable, which is a very successful enterprise, which is something I really respect and appreciate. For me personally, picking that particular problem to solve has always been about a problem that resonates with me on an emotional level, on a value system level. that is the only incentive that allows me to try and solve it hmm. so i might identify a profitable problem but it just doesn't excite me as much to chase it hmm. as a problem that has visible positive impact on communities hmm. so the valuation entrepreneurship and the uh, breakneck ecosystem that we have hmm. should exist and should thrive and it is an important and integral part of our indian youth Hmm. or economy in the future hmm. but as far as social entrepreneurship is concerned that just it's just a personal thing that i just need to pick a problem where i can see communities getting impacted positively i see i have an observation to make you are 30 in your 30s yeah you sound like uh, you are 45 your vision is that of a much older person where is all this coming from shantanu i really don't know if you literally mean sound i have a cold today so <laughs> but i don't know i i couldn't answer that myself i think i have been privileged enough to be put into situations where i'm exposed to people who are quite mm. senior in the industry mm. which allows me to perhaps absorb as much as i can mm. um uh, so i think i have an advantage in that sense mm. so it's really not me as much as the situations i've been put in and i'm quite lucky for that I feel like if the world were a binary or a spectrum right now you would have Elon Musk on one end and Mr Ratan Tata on the other a lot of young people today millennials gen z would sort of gravitate towards Elon Musk of way of life and way of uh, work what sort of brings in a person like you to understand more the values and sort of what Mr Ratan Tata actually stands for I think it's more generational than just Mr. Tata. Uh, this been five generations of my family. I'm the fifth generation who is working for the Tatas. Mm. All the generations before me had regular general roles, like an engineer here or a maintenance engineer there, starting from my great grandfather. 
So to see all the values planted in an individual won't be the right way to look at it, especially when it comes to the Tata Group. I think it has been a legacy that's been handed down so much. And my family having been exposed to that over generations has sort of allowed us to appreciate and respect mm -hmm. that more mm -hmm. or have that as a central value system for our family as well. So I think that overlapping legacy mm. where we have always respected and mm. revered the Tatas mm. through not one or two but five generations puts it in a different perspective for us of mm. who we would like to. There's a lot of younger folks today would give an arm and a leg to be in the position you are in, to be at uh, in midst of this vast pool of not just resources but also knowledge and wisdom. If you were to talk to me about a couple of traits that led you to this position, which ones would those be? I think if it all started with the story of motopoles, it was a, one was technical and one was emotional. The technical one, which I love to tell people, is that a lot of people saying, you know, you ended up where you ended up because you were in the right place at the right time. Hmm. And I say, yes, absolutely. That's the absolute correct answer, which means that you just need to put yourself in as many situations as possible for you to strike the right one. So I was always out there doing certain things and some of them were quite hmm. embarrassing to look back on, honestly. Hmm. But you never know which one is going to be the one that sort of opens that door, hmm. which is why you need to plant yourself in as many situations as possible. Hmm. And the second emotional one was when you are doing something with complete heart, hmm. There is a way where people who also believe in that same cause to gravitate mm. towards your overlap paths with you at some point, mm. somewhere, somehow. So what is your message then to those uh, young millennials at the moment who perhaps today, uh, you know, live in a world where there is no job security, there is no profession that is so-called safe or future proof to them who are looking at careers, looking at jobs. What is your advice? I think... As tough as that sounds, and I'm sure it's a bit of a struggle because I work with a lot of uh, Gen Z, especially in the senior care startup that we have. The mm. age spectrum is between 18 to 24. So I'm exposed to them constantly. I think one of the great things that I have taken advantage of in this particular tough situation is to really choose something that gives you fulfillment. And I have seen these young folks give up on financially better off possibilities just to choose something that gives them something that aligns with their personal principles and personal mm. values. Mm. Something that I would not have had the courage to do when I was starting off as a young engineer, for example. I would I went into engineering because it was safe, like you described it. A lot of my colleagues did, a lot of millennials did choose professions based on what is financially safe and what's gonna create a foundation where we are not out on the street. Mm. But this generation has the courage to choose something that aligns with their personal values, that mm. gives them a sense of fulfillment. And at the end of the day, they want to see what was it, what was the impact, impact that was created because of what I did at my job today. Mm. And if the answer to that is not clear or is murky or is a corporate wishy-washy answer, then they're just choosing to lean or not pursue that stream. And I think, I think that's brilliant because that's how change makers get made. Talking about corporate wishy-washy, let's touch upon another subject, which is very corporate nature, which is work-life balance. And I wanted to understand your take on that. We're again, like I said, binary is all around us. We have Narayan Murthy, 72 hour work in a week compared to one that was mentioned in your book as well. You said that one of the times that you were really held up by Mr. Tata was for actually making calls late in the night. Right. So where does, where does that fit in? I think... There cannot be a singular answer because company cultures, entrepreneurship cultures, individual cultures dictate the life of an employee. Mm. So for someone to say you should work for these many hours, you shouldn't, and then applying as a blanket rule across companies that have different cultures mm. would not be right. So at the risk of sounding diplomatic, it really comes down to each company and its own culture. Mm. If you asked my personal preference, of course, there should be a balance, but if you asked if I myself have balance, no, I personally like to fill in my life with a lot of things. At mm. the same time, I do not like to transfer that on to juniors 
or people younger to me or in the startup because I want to give them the right idea of knowing that a job is what you do and it's not who you are. Mm. It's not your whole identity. It should not be your whole self-worth. Mm. It's a profession at the end of the day. Yes, it puts bread and butter on the table and yes, it can be something you're passionate about in which case all these barriers won't be visible to you at which, in which case just please go ahead at full speed but to assume that everybody else will operate under that same hmm. passion is not something hmm. we should take for granted. Freedom and choices for all, I think that's where we are getting Yes, this. and the yeah. idolization culture is what is the issue. So ah. we always want someone else to give us the answer that hmm. how many hours should I be working and then Someone who you look up to says, these many hours you should be working mm. and then you want to follow just that. Mm. But it really doesn't have to be idolization to a T. Mm. We have so many amazing entrepreneurs and so many amazing leaders in the country who you should be inspired by and you mm. should take the relevant inspiration from them. Mm. But to sort of clone your entire personality after a particular person you idolize will then end up in feeling this internal conflict of, is this the right thing? Should I be working these many hours? Hmm. I want to be passionate, but I don't feel comfortable stretching myself that yeah. So Talking about inspirational entrepreneurs, name some for us. I think uh, Bhavish Agarwal is definitely uh, one of some, uh, the way he has built um, Ola. And honestly, the entire, I think for me, it's the entire entrepreneurial ecosystem and how it's sort of thriving off of each other is what mm. is the inspiration to me rather than mm. an individual. Your eyes are lighting up at the thought of Bhavesh and everything that he's doing. He's clearly not for work-life balance. I know, I know. <laughs> he's a work colleague which and he is, wants everybody to go down that road. Which mm. emphasizes my point that there are certain things that you idolize about some people and mm. you take inspiration from and certain things you don't agree on which mm. should be allowed. But how are disagreements happening when you are taking decisions along with Mr. Tata, how is that generational gap and how do negotiations and disagreements happen there? I don't think there are disagreements as such. Uh, I continue to work for him <laughs> and he is a great boss. He's a great colleague to everyone. He's been a colleague to when I have seen him and he has this way of allowing people to present their perspectives hmm. in full hmm. before everyone makes a conscious joint decision. Something that is so respectable and so statesman-like mm. and so refined in terms mm. of business that uh, authority and hierarchy doesn't as much come through. Everyone's allowed to, everyone who sees him is allowed to present that perspective in a mm. respectable manner. All right, enough of diplomatic answers over there. I'm expecting some fast-paced action now, Chantan. No, Things not. that your generation I'm not good at this. Describe Mr. Ratan Tata in one word. Kind. At 30, Shantanu is a social entrepreneur. He's a, used to be a social media influencer. He's a deputy manager. What do you plan to do when you are 86? Have a big farm with sheep and dogs on it. <laughs> okay. If you had, could go back in time and do one thing differently in your journey so far, which one would that be? Probably spend more time with my first dog. I see. Interesting. Okay. As a millennial, one word for social media. That's a tough one. <laughs> Silence, that's what I'm getting. That's There's so many word. aspects that are evolving every day. Uh, one word. Responsibility. Ah, okay. Social media does more harm than good, true or false? True. How many hours do you spend on social media? Too many. On work-life balance then, one word for 70 hours working week comment. Puzzle choice. Okay. What's your take on dating and marriage then? Any pearls of wisdom there coming from the eternal bachelor himself? Still learning. <laughs> Two attributes in an older generation that millennials miss today. A set of principles. Two attributes in dogs that humans don't have. Oh, that is less less. Living in the moment. Okay, one word for AI. Responsibility again. One tree that you have displayed perhaps to have had this journey at the data group. Curiosity. And finally, the most difficult question of all, dogs or cats? No, I can't answer that possible. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Andrew, thanks so much. Thank you.